What, give us your thoughts uh, around valuation and the company NVIDIA. No, I think NVIDIA has been a stock that I've had in my portfolio now for five years. And um, when, you, when you talk about the online and the social media revolution, somebody's got to provide the infrastructure to make it run. In the 1990s, the peak of the dot-com boom, people forget that the company that reached the highest market cap was Cisco, a company that had nothing to do with the online retail and other space, but the infrastructure for online. NVIDIA, in many ways, has powered the tech growth for this year by providing the infrastructure, the hardware, to make it happen. And I describe it as my opportunistic chip company. Well, the rest of the chip makers were kind of looking at a market that had slowed down in terms of growth. NVIDIA always seemed to be in the right place at the right time for new markets, whether that was uh, gaming or whether it was crypto and now with AI. The first time around, you can say they were lucky, but by the time you get to the third time around, this is by design. I mean, this is a company that's been opportunistic and going after markets that are just taking off and are taking, you know, have been able to benefit from those markets. So that's why I bought NVIDIA in 2018 because of the, because of their opportunistic streak in the company. And at, at the time, the price had also been knocked down. This is, again, something that people forget with these highly priced companies. They act like these companies would never be touchable as investments. But the reality is, you look at the history of NVIDIA, it's had two near-death experiences <clears throat> in the last 20 years, dropping 80% in market cap twice. And in 2018, hmm. they lost 40% of the market cap. So even these companies look and say, I would never have been able to buy that stock. There was a time in the last 15 years where you'd have been able to buy the stock. And I think that's the lesson that value, if you're a value investor, you need to take away is you cannot just take these stocks off the list of companies you're interested in investing in because at the right price, they are great investments. I know I got lucky in NVIDIA because I had no idea AI was coming, but I bought the fact that they would find a way to be in that next big market when it came along. I read your recent blog, your blog, Musings on Markets, and you wrote about AI's winners and losers, and you wrote about NVIDIA. Um, and the conclusion that you reached at the end of the blog was that even if you assume this very highly bullish stance on the AI market as a whole, as well as assuming that NVIDIA will continue to maintain relative dominance in the market, in the AI chip market, if you assume all of that, you still believe that that current $420 price point is still too high. Could you take us through your thesis there and how you concluded that? You know, in a sense, it's a series of estimates, right? So, in a, you know, you, yeah. you take AI right now, it's a $25 billion, if you're lucky, a chip market is about $25 billion. I look for estimates of how big that market could be 10 years up. The mm -hmm. biggest number I found was $350 billion. I gave NVIDIA 100% market share of that market, every single chip, so, <laughs> and I still couldn't get up to $400 per share. So you almost have to price in another market out there as big as the AI market that we haven't seen yet that NVIDIA mm -hmm. is going to be able to jump into. Could that happen? Given mm -hmm. the history over the last decade, I wouldn't rule it out. But if you price that in as an expectation, where's your upside? You know, it's one thing to buy NVIDIA yeah. at 150 and say, I'll get the optionality of jumping into that market. It's another thing to pay $400 per share, price in the expectation that there'd be another $350 billion market we haven't even seen yet that they will dominate and put that into your mm. market cap. And that seems like an incredibly large risk to take if you're an investor jumping in for the first time. What are the prospects for NVIDIA? I mean, how could NVIDIA scale? One of the things that Scott and I have talked about is how NVIDIA is not vertically integrated, and that is it designs its chips, but it doesn't build them and outsources the manufacturing to TSMC. Um, do you think that NVIDIA will need to vertically integrate at some point? Is that the solution to scale? Like, what is the, the thing that NVIDIA could do that isn't, you know, 100% market share? of the AI chip market. I don't think vertical integration is going to do it for them because that's a lower margin commoditized business. And there's a reason they've outsourced it to TSMC, which raises an interesting country risk question that I don't even want to go into now because they are entirely dependent on Taiwan Semiconductors yeah. delivering their chips. I think what they need, I mean, let's face it, five years ago, if you talked about the AI market, you said, well, it's not a big market. I don't care. Five years later, people talk about a $300 billion market. 
who knows what the next technological shift will be and what architecture we will need. So for it to scale up, you actually need a market we don't even know about yet, like the crypto market, the gaming market, and the AI market. And that's why I said it's conceivable it could happen because it's happened three times in the last 15 years. Markets that came out of nowhere that were big markets that NVIDIA happened to dominate. But you'd actually need something like that. In fact, NVIDIA's CEO talked about the omnibus, the metaverse, virtual reality, the yeah. kinds of chips you need. It's not a $300 billion market. That's not big enough. So you need a market as big as what the AI market is seen to be. And NVIDIA to dominate that market for you to be able to get a, get to $400 per share. Let's stick with AI. You wrote that you believe that AI will be negative sum. What did you mean by that? Well, I think that when people talk about AI, they talk about how it'll cut costs for companies. They can replace people with AI and that by cutting costs, they're going to make more money. And I was saying that people are tired of listening to me say, which is if everybody has it, nobody has it. So if everybody is AI and they all cut costs, the problem is somebody's also going to cut prices. And once they start cutting prices, everybody ends up with lower costs and lower prices. Your margins actually decrease because competition takes the upside away. And it's with the experience that you can look at this history, right? When PCs first came out in the 1980s, we were told about how companies would get more profitable because you could now use PCs to reduce the number of people working at your company. And that reduced costs would turn out as higher profits. Turned out not to be true. Everybody had PCs. Everybody spent more on PCs. Companies didn't come out as more profitable. And each big change, what were promised is this will cut costs, increase profits, everybody will be better off. It is, I think the beneficiaries here might be the consumers. The people who use mm -hmm. consultants might find themselves paying less for consultants if it's automated, if AI can take over that space. But I don't think the consulting companies are going to walk away as more profitable. There are going to be a subset of companies that benefit from this growth, just like in the PC business, the, the dot-com business, the social media business. So I'm sure there will be companies like NVIDIA that can benefit from the growth of AI, but most of the rest of us, I think, will find that AI doesn't deliver the promised profits that are being, that are being offered out there right now because it's not a competitive advantage. Everybody will have access to it. And I'm not sure that means that anybody walks away with an advantage from this space. Well, I was just going to ask, you bought NVIDIA in 2018. Your thesis sounds like it's probably a little overvalued at this point, or at least it's primarily driven by narrative. What is your recommendation to existing NVIDIA shareholders? I mean, I, 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 can't, I don't advise other people on what to do because they've got to factor in what they think about NVIDIA. I can tell you what I did. I sold half my holding of NVIDIA because I think it's overvalued. And I, you know, I've made back well over, I mean, seven times what I originally invested in NVIDIA collectively. I've held on to the other half because I think the momentum in this case is going to mean that the price is not going to collapse 25 or 40%. But it's on watch, which means that if I truly feel that, um, you know, th th if there's any more of a run up, that half is also ready to leave my portfolio. But I think this, you know, it's, there's an interesting question about whether we treat investments that are already in our portfolio differently than investments we plan to make for the first time. It's, I think, something that from a psychological perspective and an investment perspective is worth examining. You saw that at the Berkshire Hathaway meetings where somebody asked, yeah. I think, Charlie Munger, whether he felt comfortable that, I think, what a third of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio is in Apple. And he said, I'm completely comfortable. I'd wager if you asked him a question, would you feel comfortable taking a third of Berkshire Hathaway's money today and investing in one stock? He would say no. And I think that I'm not saying he's being irrational, but I think it's something where we treat investments that are already in our portfolio differently than investments we plan to make for the first time. And I was the first one to admit that I was being, you know, internally inconsistent by holding on to half my portfolio. If the stock drops, I can say, look, I sold half my stock. If the stock goes up, I can say, look, I held on to half. I know that sounds like something that rational people should not do, but we're human beings. I'm open about the fact that I'm being inconsistent.